What's good everyone, Marcus here again, and this time with a video topic gained from experience and knowledge that I hope everyone can benefit from. Today I'm sharing some of the training mistakes that I've made in the many years that I've trained, including some nutrition-based mistakes. I sincerely hope you find some or all of these useful, so let's get right to them. Number one, not warming up. Even when training is a consistent staple in our daily routines, we can often feel the pressure of not having enough time in a day. Feeling rushed will often make you cut corners and warm-ups tend to bite the bullet in this scenario. This is especially true when adding in a commute to a commercial gym. Even when pressed for time, you must take the time to warm up and prep your skeletal muscular system for the stresses that it will endure. This is crucial no matter how long you've been training or how often you train. It's especially important when you get up there in age as I am. As the title implies, I've been guilty of this mistake myself and I've paid for it by suffering injuries that have plagued me for years and even nagged me today. In 2018, I went into a back and biceps training session with little to no warm up because I wanted to be on my way home by a certain time. I compounded that mistake with another by switching from traditional deadlifts, which I had recently added into my routine, to trying trap bar deadlifts. Not only did I not warm up properly, but the mental cues I used with conventional deadlifts were tossed out the window. The difference in grip, balance, and weight distribution, along with rushing into the routine, was enough to throw me off, even with moderate weight. In the middle of the set, I felt a very weird sensation. It wasn't a distinct popping or snapping sensation, but more of an odd tearing and shifting on the left side of my lower back. I immediately placed the weight down and then did some stretching to try and work out what I thought might be a cramp or stiff muscle. I must have partially torn something in the area and it not only caused me a lot of pain over the next year, it obviously prevented me from continuing my posterior chain work the way that I wanted to. Omitting adequate warm-up can not only risk injury, but it can hinder your performance and full training potential. Do not let yourself rush into your workouts because you will eventually pay for that mistake. It wasn't until two years later that I was finally able to resume deadlifting again. Five to 10 minutes of warm-up is all it takes for some. Number two, no mobility work. This one may seem unimportant to many, especially younger lifters, but even they are susceptible to the problems associated with mobility issues. This has to do more with our own physical makeup and limitations of our skeletal muscular system. Joint flexibility, the fact that none of us are perfectly symmetrical from side to side, past injuries and more. One expert I follow and subscribe to on IG and YouTube is Dr. Aaron Horshig of Squat University. I highly recommend following him as he freely provides a wealth of useful information on a regular basis. There are so many useful mobility drills that you can incorporate into your training re regimen before you actually start lifting to make your training go smoothly and to perform optimally. They can also help you to avoid making mistakes that cause injury and setbacks. Even if you think your body mechanics are optimal, I suggest you take some time to film your movements and analyze them. Chances are you could improve from some basic mobility drills prior to your workouts. I wasn't aware of the importance of mobility work up until just a few years ago. It has made a huge difference in my training. Not only has it helped me improve my mechanics and the efficiency of my movements, but it has also helped me overcome some pain in various joints and continue progressing towards some great personal records. Once I started to increase my squat weight substantially above my body weight, I started developing knee pain. Knee sleeves did nothing for the pain, but some mobility exercises not only alleviated the pain, but fixed the root problem. The ankle and hip mobility drills I realized were missing before squatting has helped me immensely. If you choose to follow only one bit of advice from this video, this should be the one. Mobility work can also be considered a warm-up, so you can certainly kill two birds with one stone. Number three, bro science training. What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, bro science is not following a solid training program that efficiently targets exercises for each muscle group with an optimal amount of exercises per group with progressive overload and periodic deloads. If you're just winging it without understanding which exercises to group together for various muscles in the body, then you're not training optimally. Also, if your training doesn't incorporate progressive overload and you're essentially pushing the same weights, reps, and sets week to week, there will be no strength or muscle building. If you've ever attended a commercial gym, I'm sure you've seen certain individuals randomly selecting exercises to do, almost as if they're additioning the equipment there. Not only are they inadequately targeting muscle groups, but they're not doing enough for those groups and are not being consistent week to week. Also, a lack of logging or documenting the sets, reps, and weights, as with the program, is part of the mistake. So there won't be proper progressive overload to build on week to week. You'll just spend time training, but likely won't actually see results either in the mirror, the scale, or in your strength. Another bro science aspect is jumping around from program to program every few weeks because you're not seeing results quick enough. It's impossible to see positive results without consistency for several months at a minimum. A proper training program will target muscle groups with main lifts as well as accessory lifts 
to help those main lifts. A proper program will incorporate progressive overload to help you build strength from week to week. A proper program will incorporate a deload week to provide adequate rest and recovery while still stimulating the muscles and keeping the mechanics of the movements fresh in your muscle memory. There really is no excuse for bro science routines as there are several free programs available online from many reputable trainers and groups such as the Strength Athlete. There are also plenty of inexpensive programs available for you if you think the free programs aren't very effective. Number four on the list is no deload. Training constantly with no relief from progressive overload is not smart. No engine can go full steam ahead, working harder and harder each time without deliberately pulling back to take a break. It is why the 24 hours of Le Mans is such a grueling race for manufacturers and truly separates the winners from the losers. Any team can win a race that only takes a limited amount of laps over a couple of hours by pushing their cars to the very limits because it will be over soon. It takes a more consistent and disciplined approach to go lap after lap over 24 hours and come out a winner. Additionally, they have a team of drivers that rotate driving responsibilities every few hours to give each driver that deload they need. A weight training deload is exercising discipline and patience with your own progress. I've made this mistake myself and still see it today in some people that I know at the commercial gym. You ask how they're doing and they haven't really suffered any injuries of late, but for some reason, they're performing well below what they're used to. It's kind of like hitting a plateau where you don't feel as strong as you previously did and you're incapable of achieving the same weights, reps, and sets you did once. I believe it's because they've suffered a burnout of sorts. Our bodies can only take so much before requiring rest and recovery. If you've incorporated progressive overload with no deload, you're in your own 24-hour race, full steam ahead, driving by yourself with no rest or recovery. This is why a lot of professional training is programmed into blocks and includes a deload period. If you don't know what a deload period is, please do some research because you will absolutely benefit from incorporating this into your training on a routine basis. It is essentially maintaining your training schedule, but pulling back on intensity, load, and reps and sets. This allows the body to go through the motion mechanically and still allows for muscle stimulation, but at a much less stressful level. Typically, a new training block is began after the deload period, where you begin ramping up on progression once again. I have never performed as well as I have once I incorporated a deload. Your progression can suffer and stagnate if you don't deload at some point. Number five is nutrition base, and that is not monitoring your calories or macros. We often have a rough idea of what we need to consume nutritionally, but not all of us are paying enough attention to achieve our own training and body goals. It's easy to find the formula for your caloric intake requirements online, but how closely are you monitoring that? Maybe you're not the type to track this info and that's fine, but you will need to determine your proper intake through trial and error. That means weighing yourself daily for at least a week to see how your typical consumption affects your weight. This, of course, does not account for body fat, unless you have a body fat scale and are truly analyzing how your daily consumption is affecting your numbers. Therefore, you should consider your weight and body goals to determine your proper daily caloric intake. In addition to that, you will want to determine the proper macro ratio and amounts to achieve your goals. Are you counting your macros to ensure adequate amounts of carbs, protein, and fats? A good rule of thumb is a 40-40-20 ratio of carbs, protein, and fats, and that has been around for decades. This is a loose rule of thumb, so feel free to adjust to your own needs. This, however, still doesn't ensure an adequate amount of protein for your lean muscle mass goals, which leads me to my next point and potential mistake. Number six, not enough protein. This one is related to the previous mistake. If your goal is to gain muscle mass and you're training hard in the gym, no amount of training will make up for a lack of adequate protein. If you do not consume enough protein in a given day, you cannot build or maintain muscle mass, and all that work still won't have the positive results that you're looking for. Even if just loosely, you must watch your macros to ensure you're getting enough protein intake per day. The rule of thumb for bodybuilding for decades has been one gram of protein per pound of body weight, or 2.2 kilograms of body weight. If you intend to cut and maintain the same muscle mass and strength, then you'll need to consume even more protein. Again, this can be difficult to consume in a 24-hour period. This was my big mistake just last year when my goal was to reduce my body fat. I fully intended to maintain my muscle mass and lean down, but I did not consume enough protein and ended up losing muscle mass and the strength that came with that. I ended up not being able to squat my PR of just five weeks prior and couldn't even come close. 
That mistake was sobering and I stopped my cutting because I worked too hard to gain that muscle and strength. There just isn't any way around this requirement if the goal of gaining or maintaining mass means something to you. One way that I supplement protein intake from my normal meals, besides a protein smoothie, is to target consumption of two of these Fair Life protein milks a day. It's not a plug for the company, honestly, it just makes for a convenient way for me to hit my goals and I try to have one in the morning before lunch and again one before my training in the afternoon. At 30 grams each, that guarantees me 60 grams of protein, leaving me to consume another 165 for the remainder of the three to four meals that I have a day. If I only had three more meals with a chicken breast at about 43 grams in each, for example, that will only account for 129 grams, falling short of my goal of 225 grams by 36 whole grams. That's like another chicken breast right there. Also, science tells us that skeletal muscle protein synthesis our ability to effectively absorb that protein is maximized by 25 to 35 grams of high quality protein per meal. So I may not even benefit from the 43 grams of protein in a chicken breast. And I really should have that fourth solid meal to ensure maintaining my goal of 225 grams of protein per day. I know what you're thinking. It can be challenging to consume an adequate amount of daily protein. And I hope this information helps to open your eyes to just how much protein you may need to consume for your goals. Number seven, too much cardio. Now this is only a mistake for some individuals, not everyone. For anyone looking to gain weight or mass or even maintain a certain level of strength, doing too much cardio can have a negative impact on those goals. Having a goal to gain weight mass requires a caloric surplus, period. If you incorporate too much cardio, you will struggle to hit those goals because you're making more and more difficult to achieve a surplus. By burning more and more calories with excessive cardio, you're essentially moving your target number of calories out of reach. It would require the intake of a massive amount of calories to counter that calorie burn, and there are only so many hours in a day. The same applies if you've achieved a certain level of strength that you want to maintain. You have to be careful with the amount of cardio that you do, as you can create a weight loss with the calorie deficit your excess cardio creates. That weight loss cannot specifically target just fat, unfortunately, and it will cannibalize your muscle mass as well. It's simply a byproduct of a caloric deficit. Unless you're religiously watching your macros to ensure your intake of protein will maintain the muscle mass that you have, you can expect to lose muscle mass. Also, that excess cardio can make tracking those macros challenging and the negative impact on the muscle mass may still happen. Again, if you're trying to cut or lean down, this doesn't apply to you as this mistake is only relative to those hoping to gain or maintain muscle mass. Well, those are a few of the most important mistakes that I've learned from over the many years of training. So I hope that you can take something away from this video to help improve your own training results. I'm interested to hear from you. So please comment below and let me know some of the mistakes that you may have made over the years and how you've overcome them. Thanks as always for watching and supporting the channel and I'll catch you in the next one.